How are you, folks? Welcome back to our channel, where we journey through the pages of history to explore the captivating tales of the Wild West. Today, we're going to discover how people in this rugged frontier region spent their precious free time. Before we ride into this adventure, if you're enjoying our content and want to keep exploring the fascinating history of the Wild West, make sure to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. It's the best way to stay up to date with our tales from the frontier. Now, let's kick back, relax, and journey into the world of leisure and entertainment in the Wild West. Much of the entertainment in the Old West took place in familiar places such as saloons and brothels. But as the variety of sporting events and recreational activities spread throughout the country, the Old West was able to participate in some unique experiences soon after arriving. Wild West entertainment may not be your favorite image, but pioneer men, women, and children had many different ways to spend their free time. Remember to hit that subscribe button and like the video if you're loving the content. Your support means the world to us. Attending medicine shows, the Medicine Show was hosted by traveling vendors who provided entertainment while promoting the healing properties of elixirs and tonics. Ointments and salves are said to contain snake oil, a panacea for countless ailments. Medical fairs toured the country, carts of goods, claiming that unique or patented medicines could treat aches, pains, illnesses, and chronic conditions. In medical shows, viewers are shown amazing stunts by muscle men or professors who lecture on efficacy, and viewers, often actors and actresses who were in place before the show began, he performed an amazing feat of being magically healed after treatment. Drug dosage. Shows may be hosted by individuals or businesses, many of the latter appropriating Native American remedies to sell pharmaceuticals. Kickapoo Indian Medicines was founded by John Healy and Charles Bigelow and was known for the Kickapoo Indian Sagwa. This elixir of herbs, roots, and animal fats mixed with alcohol was marketed as a proven elixir passed down through generations. Kickapoo Indian Sagwa was said to cure everything from kidney and liver ailments to arthritis, but it was more of a laxative than anything else. Attending Living Picture Shows for Fun The Living Pictures show features realistic presentations of paintings and sculptures with actors and models and was first shown in major cities such as London and New York. The first living pictures were educational in nature, but as the content became more daring, they evolved into a form of folk entertainment. Live Kamishibai also includes orchestral music and can be of a hybrid nature, mixing living and still artistic elements. However, this was not without criticism. Concerned about immorality and threats to public order, groups such as the Women's Christian Temperance League protested live Kamishibai, claiming that Kamishibai were degrading vulgar, and of no greater artistic value. Other observers, including many of the exhibition's participants, saw that the living images had a positive impact and increased general knowledge of art. Attending a minstrel show. Beginning in the early 19th century, his minstrel shows featured musical and comedic performances by white performers in blackface and his paint. The actors used movement and dialogue to exaggerate the characteristics and culture of African Americans, intended to appear humorous to white audiences. Minstrel groups toured the United States, crossing the same circles as medicine, vaudeville, and other contemporary touring shows. Not all minstrel show performers were white, and many African American musicians composed songs for minstrel shows. Toilet. Needless to say, the bards were infamous in the eyes of many black upper classes. But it was also true that all of this generation's greatest talents followed the same drain. Composers, singers, musicians, speakers, stage performers, minstrel shows have it all. Another prominent black artist, James Brand, was known as the world's greatest bard and captivated African-American audiences with his compositions and performances. Watching prize fighting in Old West. European boxers like Jem Mace arrived in the United States in his mid-1800 and helped popularize boxing throughout the growing nation. Mace put on a boxing show to showcase his skills to his audience. As the father of modern boxing, he competed in numerous fights in California and Nevada. In 1876, Mace won the $1,000 and gold trophy belt in front of a large crowd when he fought Bill Davis in Virginia City, Nevada. The growth of prize wars in the American West was largely due to the influence of immigrants, especially the Irish, who had a long tradition in the sport. However, 
not all boxers come from abroad. Successful American martial artists John Chansey and Mike Donovan faced each other in a bout directed by Wyatt Earp in 1869. A fistfighter ready to fight barehanded became so prolific by the late 19th century that the federal government enacted his 1896 law banning bounty fights. Going to the Salon Taverns were a common meeting place in the American West. Saloons doubled as dance halls, hosted small shows, acted as gambling venues, and perhaps most importantly, served alcohol. A saloon is a building with a well-designed bar or a tent with a few planks where, mostly, men can sit and drink. While many saloons have barmaids and waitresses, bartenders were most consistently present. The bartender served whiskey, a strong, pungent liquor with names like Lightning of Teos and Tarantula Juice. Until the advent of refrigerators in the late 19th century, beer was served at room temperature when available. Every city had a large number of taverns, and shops often served food to attract customers. In New Orleans, for example, bar patrons were offered a free lunch consisting of cold meats, crackers, cheese, and possibly a hot cup of soup. But the free lunch served a public need and attracted guests from all backgrounds and professions. According to one observer, lawyers, doctors, gamblers, school teachers, clerks, workers, people of all nationalities were among the thousands of New Orleans who live off free lunches. It says, watching public hangings, Executions in the Old West were mass-attended events. Townspeople and individuals from the surrounding area gathered to keep an eye out for impostors such as William Van Horn and William Wilson. Convicted of Kansas murder, Van Horn was hanged in December 1863 in Colorado in front of at least 1,500 men, women, and children. For Wilson, a New Mexico rancher, the act took place before a large angry mob in 1875. Known as the Executioner Prince, George Malden served as executioner for Judge Isaac Parker of Arkansas and hanged 22 people in seven public executions between 1873 and 1876. During the process, five or six people were thrown from the scaffolding at the same time. It was also possible to examine the corpses if they were unable to come to the gallows event. For example, in 1882, when the remains of James of Jesse were unveiled to the public, hundreds of people were able to see them. Visiting a brothel. In the Wild West, taverns and brothels may often have been one and the same, but they were not always. Many of the women in the saloon were known as painted ladies and lived as escorts or worked as dance hall girls. In some cath houses, older women and women unsuitable for the work of painted lady could perform carnal services, often under the supervision of a madam. Facilities may include single-family homes, simple dwelling like buildings, or even cribs and shacks lined up on the outskirts of town. Depending on location, men paid up to $50 for entertainment, or less than $1 a night. Running a cat house is very competitive. Madams strive to provide clean women and a comfortable environment. For example, Madam Dora of Deadwood, South Dakota, was known for her honesty and fairness, including having her wives do the laundry regularly and always being nice to her customers. She was so successful that she was able to expand and open more residences in cities such as Sturgis and Rapid City. Going to a theater. As small settlements grew into cities, theaters also became part of the landscape. When traveling troopies visited these places, locals as well as townspeople had the opportunity to appreciate the performances. Theaters vary in size and can hold hundreds or even thousands of people. Enthusiastic crowds gathered, and theaters were often filled to capacity. Theaters often had special boxes for the wealthy. Some private lodges were called box houses, where attendants served as amenities. Places like Kansas City, where the public could support it, had theater artists such as the group that staged Sheridan Knoll's The Hunchback in 1864. These men and women, who later came to be known as Company Limited, staged a theatrical cycle that included comedy and drama alike. The theater didn't necessarily have to be a formal venue either. Makeshift venues were often created under tents, in churches and taverns, or where people would gather in public. Gambling was another way of spending time. Gambling in the American West included everything from horse racing to shooting competitions to card games. Soldiers and miners gambled in camps, townsfolk flocked to saloons and arcades to place bets, and professional gamblers roamed from town to town winning big along the way. 
Poker was his one of the most commonly played card games in the Wild West. This is the game enjoyed by professional gamblers such as James Butler Wild Bill, Hickok, and John Henry Doc Holliday. They continue to embody the frontier male gambler. Best poker, his player is wise to play with his back to the wall so that no one can sneak up behind him or see his cards. They were always on alert and ready to launch an attack when their anger began to rage. Other card games included Euchre, Blackjack, Monty, and Pharaoh. As more settlers moved west, arcades became more common in cities such as Omaha, Austin, Virginia City, and San Francisco. Arcade received mixed reactions from observers. Social reformers associated them with aggression, heavy drinking, and moral depravity, while successful gamblers and those who invested in gambling businesses viewed them as public and economic goods. Participated in a circus or entertainment. From the mid-19th century onwards, circus and show performances, the latter often used as a euphemism for freak show, presented a unique physical specimen to enthusiastic audiences. They announced their arrival well in advance and admired the novelty and animal wonders. The circus preparation itself was a show. Spectators watched as people, animals, and equipment rushed into town on floats. In circuses, magnificent elephant-like creatures were seen galloping alongside horses and performing complex movements. Acrobats and clowns entertained the audience, as well as side attractions such as Siamese twins, a bearded woman, and a dwarf. The expansion of the railroad in the late 19th century allowed the circus to travel more easily around the country and put on more performances. By the end of the century, the newly formed Barnum and Bailey Circus had over 1,200 performers, not to mention hundreds of animals, performing to thousands under a large tent. The Wii Participating in a Rodeo Rope, equestrian and wrestling competitions captivated audiences throughout his 19th century, but it was not until his early 20th century that the term rodeo came into use for these competitions. The rodeo grew out of a cattle ranching tradition that began as an informal competition between ranchers and cattlemen in the 1820s and he 1830. Once the cowboys crossed the American border, they demonstrated their craft in local saloons and open fields. Audiences flocked to see it, but as employment opportunities for cowboys declined towards the end of the century, many turned to Wild West shows. As the ruggedness of the Wild West diminished and viewers sought to capture a slice of frontier life before their eyes, rodeos grew in popularity as a popular pastime. Already in 1873, William F. Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill, had an exhibition recreating frontier adventures. Rope tricks and other cattle-stealing tricks were accompanied by marksmanship demonstrations and presentations of Native Americans in full tribal costume. In towns such as Prescott, Arizona, and Cheyenne, Wyoming, prizes were awarded to the best bronc riders and ox riders in cowboy contests in the late 1880 and early 1890. In 1929, the American Rodeo Association was formed to oversee the burgeoning sport, going to church gathering. As a result of the so-called Second Great Awakening, a religious renaissance that spread across the American frontier in the early 19th century, Many men and women of the Old West returned to religious practice. In the Second Great Awakening, caused by spiritual decline, Protestant ministers held rallies in border camps to encourage audiences to take responsibility for their own salvation. Worship services during the Second Great Awakening included long exuberant sermons, a type of performance, accompanied by music. Camp meetings were often not segregated, lasted several days, and had some success in increasing church membership. Protestantism remained strong in parts of the western frontier, including Nebraska, where by the early 1870 were held about every six weeks on weekdays, afternoons, and evenings. It was so popular that almost the whole town attended. Bishop Cyrus Townsend Brady once recalled that when a theater troupe entered town on a night of service, it sold very few tickets and rescheduled performances to accommodate church attendance. At number 13 we have boxing. Boxing was one of the best ways to enjoy the Old West. No equipment was needed and space was limited. I didn't need to clear the field. The rules were surprisingly simple. You can always find two men willing to fight over money. And the unreasonable violence of the time fostered the aggression of border residents. It should come as no surprise, then, that boxing was one of the pioneers' favorite pastimes. Boxing matches often sell out. 
legendary figures from the Old West also attended. Okay, corral participant Wyatt Earp began refereeing boxing matches in his later years. He has also become the face of the West Coast boxing world. By the late 19th century, thousands of tickets to semi-legal boxing matches were routinely sold in California cities. As expected, the battles often devolved into violent altercations. Participants drank heavily and wagered money. When they got too out of control, a skirmish broke out in the crowd. Suddenly, boxing started in and around the ring. At various points in the 19th century, sheriffs tried in vain to contain boxing promoters. Various border towns moved to outlaw fighting in public. But neither the organizers nor the fans cared. People still flocked to illegal fights. And the most creative promoters have jumped at the opportunity to operate within the law. If boxing is illegal in a city, promoters will put on plays. Fortunately, one of the play's entrances involved a duel between his two men on stage. A loophole worked, and the public was fed up with legal, organized violence. 